Well then, let's see. Singularity University, I'll give you a little bit of background on this. Basically what we do is we teach people about fast changing technologies. We crack their heads open. We get them to look a little bit down the road in the future at how these technologies are changing, how they're getting faster, better, cheaper, and we challenge people to go and help a billion people go and literally do something that changes the world, makes it a better place. I sit at the intersection of two of the fastest growing technologies, and one of them is computers. Computers are changing the world, we all know this. The other technology that's changing is life science, genetics, genomics, biotechnologies. For the last 50 years, we've actually been competing. The transistor and DNA were actually discovered very close together. Bioinformatic or genomic technologies and the computer chip, very close together in the early 1970s. And computers have an early head start in taking over the world. I'd like to suggest that even evolution evolves, and we're in one of the most fascinating periods in technology right at this point in time. We take, you know, for centuries, millennia, we've looked up at the night skies and we've seen all these stars. And we've, they've inspired us to tell great stories and we've wondered what's going on out there and we know today that there's a hundred billion stars just in our own Milky Way galaxy. It's just this massive volume. And for about 400 years we've been building telescopes to go and study these stars. And yet, we still haven't found life anywhere else. If you want to think about a wonderful world, it's that this thin little band of atmosphere you see here, which runs up a few miles and then a few miles down to the Earth, is our complete biosphere. This is where all life exists that we know of in the universe. And I'm not talking just intelligent life, I'm talking any life. And we've been going around, we are the most successful. We've got seven billion of us. And we're changing and terraforming the world. We're lighting up entire continents rivaling electrical storms. We're hitching a ride here on the International Space Station and we're still looking for life even on our closest neighbors. It is a truly wonderful world. And yet, in looking for life, we've kind of been looking in the wrong places. You take those telescopes and you turn them around, they become microscopes. And 400 years ago, we realized, holy moly, there's all of these living organisms all around us, in us, on us, everywhere. We didn't see these like the stars in the sky before. They were invisible to the naked eye. But this is where life teems in the universe, and we're just starting to understand it. With our technologies now, you can look into the face of a spider See its quizzical expression. <laughs> you can look at the textures on the tongue of a butterfly. You can look at the sumptuous lips of a housefly. <laughs> this is the world of the micro. This is the world of the cell. This is the world of the molecular. And we're opening it up and cracking it open wider and wider as our, as our microscopes get better and better and our tools and technologies for looking into this world. This is my favorite creature of all time. This is the E. coli bacterium. <laughs> e. coli was one of the first organisms on this planet about four billion years ago, and it'll probably be one of the last. And it made a pretty good deal with us. It said, hey, look, keep us in your guts and feed us, and we'll in turn feed your systems, and meanwhile, you just carry us around. These little guys have been all over the world, just with me in the last year. <laughs> and with my friend Dan Barry, the astronaut, they've been up to space, and they're still there. Dan had to come home. <laughs> I teach that these little guys, they kind of look like sausages, are computers. Not the types of computers that we might expect, but these cells are like our cell phones. They can live independently or they can work better in a network. They detect signals of all different types. They do input and output calculations. 
What's absolutely remarkable about these little critters, though, is that they've transcended our phones. They are actually able to reproduce. One becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight. This is the true exponential technology on the planet. They're absolutely incredible. One day our cell phones might get close to this when you can plug them in and you get two in the morning. <laughs> or if they shrink small enough that they're like mitochondria powering our cells. If you take one of these bacteria and you squish it, like you were squishing a tube of toothpaste, its genome comes out of it. This is the operating system of a bacterium. 4.6 megabits, tiny, really tiny, but that's all you need for one of the most complicated and successful free-living organisms on the planet. And when I saw this picture, I was astounded. I was a computer geek. I loved computers. I saw this picture, and I saw this. And after that, that was it. I was going to be a genetic scientist. Thankfully, you can't read DNA code very easily. It's ATGCG. So you have to write computer software. And I was one of the first people doing that, kind of organizing all this information. And I became fascinated with the genetic language. And I realized it is a language. It's a, it's a programming language. Every living thing on this planet uses the same operating system, uses the same programming language, from bacteria all the way to us and everything in between. So I became fascinated with this. And there's, like all languages, there's reading, there's comprehension, and there's writing. And I was really lucky, because when I got into this, reading started to take off. DNA sequencing was going crazy, because they had just announced the Human Genome Project. So I started doing a bacterial genome project. Comprehension, that was writing programs. And today, that's called bioinformatics or systems biology, and it really takes Watson-level intelligence to start aggregating all this information. We're generating more genomic sequence data than you can imagine. It's growing faster than Moore's Law, not doubling every year, 10 times per year. But it was writing genomic code that fascinated me. And I was very fortunate. I joined one of the first biotech companies, and we just wrote little tiny scripts to make proteins, and we sold them for billions of dollars. I like writing programs. There's low-hanging fruit here. <laughs> Thing is, after six years or seven years with this company, we weren't making bigger and more complex programs. It wasn't getting faster, better, cheaper. And then all of a sudden, about seven or eight years ago, we started to see the appearance of a new technology. It's basically a printer for DNA. And now you don't have to go and spend a lot of time getting a PhD to write a genetic program. Literally, you can just work away on a computer and type and print DNA, and DNA is the program for living things. So now we have a clear path from bits to atoms to biology. We've never had this before. It's accessible to virtually everyone. You send away a bit of code, which can be machine-generated or it can be designed by us, and you get back DNA in a tube. And the cost of doing this is falling straight to zero. DNA is one of the cheapest substances on the planet. What are we making with all this? Well, you start bottom up. And the absolute simplest thing to make in biology is the virus. It's not alive. The virus is software. That's all it is. It's just software. It's the app. In fact, more than that, because it can move between different organisms, it's also a bit like a packet on the biological networks. This is one of the most incredible little agents in the world, and we don't understand it. There are billions of viruses on the planet. We've only plucked 5,000 of them out and given them a name and figured out some function. But there's literally billions of these things. We tend to think of them all as bad. Malware, <laughs> flus, colds, Ebola. No, we haven't even started wrapping our brain around what are the positive reasons for these things to, to exist. There's proteins in our body that come from viral origins, and if we didn't have them, we couldn't be born. 
That's something to think about. The cold you catch actually trains your immune system so it doesn't overreact to foreign proteins, more sophisticated viruses. But more than that, we're learning how to program these viruses to do really beneficial things for us. You might have heard of gene therapies. That's just one aspect. Gene therapies can fix a problem with a cell. We're learning how to turn these things into cancer therapies. We're learning how to use these as building blocks for manufacturing to make enzymes and catalysts to replace chemistry. And the list will go on. One day there will be viruses that will make your hair grow, that will change the ability of your eyes to see in different spectrum, that will literally rewrite broken cellular genomes. We're going to have a whole biological software industry, which is pretty cool and scary at the same time. Because we know that sometimes you can make these things that are pretty nefarious. And again, they're tiny, and everyone can start to do it. So our, we need people like Mark, because bio is the new cyber. But thankfully, we're learning a lot of the rules of the game from the computer world. More than that, we've already moved on to free living organisms. Last year, researchers made the first synthetic bacterium. Again, moving up the complexity in the programs. That was pretty cool. We're going to get thousands more of these, thousands. And we're going to keep marching up in our programming complexity at a pace that will astound you. We're not ready for this, but it's time we start thinking about it. Because it's pretty clear that we're going to keep moving incredibly fast. Last, just a few weeks ago, a paper came out that they've already managed to replace the synthetic, a chromosome arm on a yeast with a synthetic version. And now that's significant to me because yeast are about a billion years more evolved than bacteria, and they're also the foundation of bread and beer. <laughs> you guys don't play with bacteria at home, but I'm sure you made a loaf of bread and you've probably had a glass of wine here. Incredibly important stuff. This is the global distribution system. People are putting the weirdest things in yeast, too. There was a paper this summer where they were actually putting the precursors of LSD into yeast. Now that's going to be a beer that's going to be a big seller. <laughs> this technology is changing so fast, so fast, I can already see a time when we can make a synthetic human genome. It's not that much more complex than a yeast. This is a human genome project for the 21st century. Not reading it, that's 20 years ago. Writing it. That means we need to start thinking about what we want to be this century. We've actually moved past Darwinism, the idea of natural selection, the idea of survival of the fittest. We're entering a whole new phase in our evolution this century. And whether it's the rapid evolution of computing that will continue to challenge us in our thinking abilities, or enhance our thinking abilities. And this is starting to move into the actual biological realm, where, it's, where we actually are going to be responsible for every living thing on the planet and choose what we want to create. Not survival of the fittest, but the construction of the intended. And we're going to have to learn a few tricks from biology and from the computer world to keep us safe in this process. But the next programming paradigm is life science. The people that were programming computers 30 years ago, the kids, they're all moving into biology now. And we better give them the right culture, the right support, and we better start building the right systems in society to watch what they're doing. Because we're going to create a living world this century. And I think that's an idea we're spreading. Thank you.